So today we're going to talk about heart rhythm, the electrical system, and also look at different EKGs and diagnose different heart rhythm problems looking at EKGs. And this can be found, is it chapter 19 that you have open there in your textbook? Chapter 18, okay, chapter 18 in your textbook um, is where to find this information. So we're going to first, first of all look at the vessels that lie over the heart because commonly a reason for people to develop a rhythm problem is because there's some damage to cells in the heart that are part of the conduction system. So as a result, the impulse doesn't get transmitted across the heart correctly and they end up with rhythm problems like heart block. And heart attack is a reason for that myocardial infarction, which is a blood clot in the arteries lying over the heart, because we know that fresh oxygen is delivered to the myocardium through the coronary circulation, through the arteries of the heart. So it's important to know some of those vessels that lie over the heart. So your first set of objectives here in your lab packet, starting on page 81, are identifying those vessels over the surface of the heart. So in the PowerPoint that I put out on Blackboard here, um, I found a nice picture of the coronary artery. So at the base of the aorta, where we get that freshly oxygenated blood that just came back from the lungs to the left ventricle, it gets pumped to the aorta, and there's an exit from the base of the aorta that goes right over the surface of the heart to make sure the heart cells get what it needs in terms of oxygen. So you've got the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. Which side of the heart pumps a higher pressure of blood? Blood under high pressure. The, the left ventricle has a thicker outer wall and it's working under high pressure. And it pumps fresh blood to the entire body. So the, uh, a blood clot that serves, the, or th that serves most of the left side of the heart is through the left coronary artery. And there's two branches of that. We have the left anterior descending artery here, and then we have the circumflex. And if you look at the circumflex, it kind of goes around and wraps around the back side and the front side, the left, the left front and back of the heart. That's the circumflex. And I work on a cardiac unit, and we often talk about the vessels which were clotted and required bypassing when people have bypass surgery. And these are very common vessels that are blocked and and are involved in those conversations about bypassing. So you just need to know which vessels are which. So way up here at the top is the left and right coronary artery, and then the branch, branches of the left coronary are the circumflex, and then down here the left anterior descending. And then on the right side we have the posterior interventricular artery is what your textbook calls it, right? We talked about that. Going back to our objectives, posterior interventricular artery is on the back side, which this diagram calls it the posterior descending artery. Same thing. So just know that the circumflex artery is one that's on the left side, right, of the heart, the left circumflex. It goes around the back as well as the front. So that's bringing freshly oxygenated blood to the heart. And then uh, and there's capillaries embedded in the heart muscle where that um, supply is given. And then it comes back to the heart, the, the chambers of the heart, through the veins. So the veins collect the used blood. And we have the cardiac vein on the front. And looking at your objectives, you have to know the great cardiac vein, the coronary sinus, and the anterior cardiac vein. So the great cardiac vein is shown here coming straight down on the left side. And then the anterior cardiac vein, looking in your textbook, is on the other side. It's both of these here coming down. This says small cardiac vein, but it's these on the front side of the heart. So these are branches of the anterior cardiac veins. You have the great cardiac vein on the left side and the anterior cardiac vein on the right side. And both of those deliver blood to a collecting, kind of a large vessel that collects that deoxygenated blood, and that's the coronary sinus. 
so this kind of large, wide collecting vessel receives blood from the veins of the heart. And then that connects to what chamber in the heart receives deoxygenated blood? Yeah, the right atrium. So the coronary sinus will lead to the right atrium and deliver that used blood. So it can go to the right ventricle and then up to the lungs to get reoxygenated and to start that circulation all over again. So expect to see a diagram of the heart showing those vessels and identifying those. Then the next part is looking at parts of a normal ECG or EKG, kind of use those terms interchangeably. So if we look at a typical EKG, that's what's shown here. And we get an EKG whenever we want to look at a patient's heart function. So this tells us the electrical system of the heart and how the heart is functioning. So we look for changes in an EKG. So we try to get a baseline on patients when they come in for some heart condition, and then we look for changes in that if they should have you know, new symptoms or a change in their status. So first of all, to get this EKG, we have to put patches at specific places over the surface of the skin because voltages from this electrical activity in the heart is displaced across the tissues underneath the skin, so we don't put it right over the heart because just the way it's transmitted over the surface, we have to have specific placements to get a good reading across the heart. So when we place the patches, if we do a five lead, like if a patient is in the hospital and we wanna monitor their rhythm throughout the entire time they're in the hospital, there's a special box, it's called a telemetry box, and it does it remotely, measures their rhythm remotely, and there's someone who is in a different room called central monitoring, and there's a bunch of screens in front of them that are hooked up to each telemetry box, and it just measures their rhythm. And if something unusual happens, that screen will flash, and it'll identify the rhythm. And the person in charge of central monitoring, the, the worker, sometimes it's a nurse's aide with special training that's in charge of central, in charge of that central monitoring room. So it, it's not something that you know is highly skilled. It can be you can be trained to identify these rhythms. And then they'll call the nurse's aide. Um, if it's just like a low battery, they'll call the nurse's aide and say, hey, can you replace the battery? Or if, or if something looked funny because a patch fell loose, the patient was sweating or bathing or moving around in bed or pulled one off, then they call and ask to replace it. But if it looks like a funny rhythm, like a deadly rhythm, which we'll talk about, then they're going to call a code or a special phone. And in our floor, it's a phone, like an old-fashioned phone that you had maybe when you were young, depending how old you are, that just rings like an old-fashioned phone. And we're not used to that sound anymore, right? We're used to the beeping digital. So when you hear the traditional ring ring of a phone in the hallway, and it hangs in the hallway, it's red. When you hear that phone ring, no matter whose patient it is, you run to that phone, you answer it, and they'll say the room number and what kind of rhythm is going on. And then you run to the room, and if the patient is responsive and looks at you and says, hey, what's up? Then you know they're probably okay, but they could be at risk for having a more deadly rhythm develop. So you take vitals and you assess them. Or other times we'll come in there and the patient will be you know, unconscious. And then we call, we do you know, basic CPR, depending what their code status is, we'll intervene. So this is real common, this five lead. So you place a patch and they're based on color coding. The, the, the wires coming off the telemetry box have code, color coding to them. So there's black wire, brown, white, green, and red wire. And then you just put the patches in the appropriate places on their chest, and then you just snap them onto those patches. So this is real common. What we're going to do in class today is a limb lead EKG. So we don't want to have to put stuff on the surface of your skin. We're just going to use your wrist and your ankle area. So people usually holler because they didn't shave their legs lately, and it's the fall time. But we're not going to judge you on that unless you're really furry and we can't get a good connection, then we need to shave. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened in the past, so I wouldn't assume it's going to happen today. So we're going to do this in class today. Some people that are in for heart attack or having unusual symptoms will have a 12-lead or 15-lead EKG. And that's much more detailed. That's given by a specialist who knows how to apply those patches and where to apply those patches. But we really look for specific you know, functions within the heart with the 12 and 15-lead. So that's much more detailed. So this is what a typical EKG wave looks like. We see repeating patterns of this rhythm. And you have to know the different parts of that. So 
looking at the first, the, the, kind of the easier interpretation, that first bump, the P wave, that just indicates that the atria are depolarizing and getting ready to contract. So anytime you look at a, an EKG, we're looking at electrical activity and we're thinking ion flow. So it indicates contraction shortly after we see that bump. So right after we see the P wave, the atria are depolarizing, which means what? Sodium is coming into the cell, right? And then later on, calcium, because it's a contractile cell. Um, so that electrical activity precedes or happens right before the actual mechanical movement of the chamber or the contraction. So if we see a P wave, we know it's depolarizing, we assume it's going to contract shortly thereafter. So the depolarization happens first, and that's what this measures is the depolarization. So this, is the, this represents the atria depolarizing. So that is due to that impulse traveling um, from or the, the SA node receiving an action potential, you know, that slow drift. We talked about pacemaker potentials in lecture last week, that slow drift toward threshold, and then it fires. So the atria um, are depolarizing at that point. Then at the Q is where the start of the Q is where the ventricles start to depolarize. So we have what's called the PR interval, I'm sorry, the PQ interval, or I guess it's the PR, okay, never mind. What do we, let's, let me go back and look and see what's on your objectives to make sure I'm consistent with that. PR interval, okay, and then the PR segment. Okay, if you look in your description, everything is labeled here. So the P wave, we said, was atrial depolarization. And the distance of that P wave should be less than three small squares. So when we look at a rhythm strip, we're going to see these squares in the background. So we can see one, two, three squares here. That P wave should be less than three squares. It should be a you know rapid depolarization, and then we should be looking at the ventricles. So then the next segment or the next portion is the PR segment, and that's described here. So from the end of that P wave to the beginning of the QRS, that means the impulse is traveling from the atria from the SA node where it starts to the AV bundle. So if you remember where the AV bundle is, that's the bundle of Hiss right at the top of the interventricular septum. So now we're getting ready to contract. So we can measure that, that distance of that PR segment. And then the QRS complex is when the, the ventricles are depolarizing. So they're beginning to contract. So they're receiving the impulse and they're getting ready to contract. So if we look at that, it's always going to be the largest wave in the EKG, this QRS complex. And notice how narrow it is compared to the P and the T wave. The P and the T wave are kind of stretched out, aren't they? The, P, the QRS complex is very um, narrow. And it should be, because when the ventricles contract, it should be forceful and brief to eject that blood. Yes? Um, that's another thing we can measure, but that's not in your lab objective, so. PR. Yeah, the PQ, uh, let me look. I was just looking at it here. The PQ interval, is the, from the beginning of the atria exciting to beginning of the ventricles exciting, but PR segment is what is in your lab packet, so you don't have to worry about the PQ interval. Your textbook talks about it, but we're going to refer to it as the PR segment. 
Okay, so again, looking at the distance then, it should be about one to two and a half boxes if it's a normal ventricular contraction and depolarization. So if we look here, if I look at this, yep, that makes sense, about one and a half, right, total. If I go from Q to S, it's about one and a half boxes, so that looks good. All right, and then the ST segment is from the end of the QRS to the beginning of the T. So it should be flat, horizontal line. So the ventricles are contracting, pressure is building. So we're looking at this distance here. The ST segment should be flat. Notice it's even with this line, pretty close, maybe just a little higher, but it should be primarily the same height as the PR. When we see elevations of this segment, that can indicate a heart attack or damage to the heart. And then we have the T wave. The T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. So the ventricles are getting ready to relax here. And during this time, we should also see I'm sorry, not during this time. During this time, the QRS, we should also be expecting that the atria are repolarizing, right, during this time. But it's buried in this because as the atria are relaxing, the ventricles are contracting, that would be buried. The repolarization of the atria would be buried in the QRS complex. So we don't see that part. But we do see the ventricles repolarizing as a separate wave. And then the PR interval. So going from, wait, we talked about that one already. Oh, I'm sorry, PR segment and PR interval. So looking at the PR segment to the PR interval, so the PR interval is from the beginning of the P wave to the start of or to the peak of ventricular contraction or depolarization and the PR segment is from the end of atrial depolarization to the start of ventricular depolarization. So the interval, it just depends, interval segment, segment is between, if you think about it, segment is between, it's, how should I say this, it's, it's the time period from the end of one uh, waveform to the beginning of another. That's a segment. And the intervals are from the beginning of one segment to the beginning of the next segment. Does that make sense? So beginning to beginning is the interval, and end of one to the beginning of the other is segment, because these can easily be confused. So a lot of times we look at the this time period of these intervals to determine if there's a delay. If there's some problem in the conduction system, we're going to see that interval stretched out longer than it should be. And again, indicating there's some problem with the transmission of that impulse, maybe due to damage to cells on the conduction pathway. So then the QT interval is from the start of the, again, it's from the start of one to the start of getting ready for the next EKG waveform, so the start of the ventricular contraction to the end of depolarization. So we're going to, any time after the T wave is complete, we can have another action potential begin. So we could start another P wave right after this T wave is finished. Sometimes you see them real close together, the T wave and the P wave of the next waveform, especially if someone has a really fast heart rate, right? You're going to see those close together. All right, so if we look at a paper, rhythm strips, they're on special paper with these squares. I'm going to make this bigger. So if we look at these large squares, so one large square represents 0.2 seconds in time. So one large square on rhythm strip is one second. So if we go and look at, let's see, Um, 
We'll look at this one here. So one of these, so going back, to, so this is what my rhythm strip looks like. I'll make this bigger. Well, it's not much bigger. Okay, so here's, oh, sorry about that. So here's a rhythm strip. Here's one large square. So if I go back here, whoops, go up one. So one large square represents 0.2 seconds. So 0.2 times 5 is... One, right? So five of these large squares equals one second. If I look at one of these very tiny squares inside of here, that represents 0 0.04 seconds. So you have to understand the timing of each of the size of squares. So one square is 0 0.2 seconds, and five of them in a row next to one another represents one second. So if I'm looking at these two, if I'm looking at this tracing here, and we go back to your objectives, there's different ways that we can measure heart rate. So there's the six second method, the large box method, and the small box method. You'll be expected to know how to do each of these, which is a little tricky. So the easiest method is you count the number of QRS complexes in six seconds and multiply it times 10. So I would highlight this one, just highlight this sentence right here, or starting with count. Count the number of QRS complexes in six seconds and multiply by 10, and that'll give you your beats per minute. So we said five of these was equal to what? To what? One second. So if I start here, this is one second, two, three, four, five, six, right? So that would be six seconds, correct? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm counting the large boxes. Between these two lines is one large box, right? So we have six of those. So how many? QRS complexes do we have in there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Eight in six boxes, right? Everybody agree with that? So what is the heart rate? Eight times 10, 80. So that's a real easy way to do this, is just find six seconds. And if one falls like right on the line, well, it's up to you to decide, right? Because does it matter if someone is 80 beats a minute versus 88, if I count an extra one? Or let's say I missed one, they're 72 instead of 80. Is that gonna matter in terms of if they're in a deadly rhythm or not? No, because when they're in a deadly rhythm, they're gonna be like in the 150s, or they're gonna be down in the 40s. You know, it's clearly, if you're off by eight, you're still gonna be in a deadly rhythm range, right? So don't get too hung up if you're off by one square. Okay, so that's the six second method. Large box method is a little trickier, but sometimes the more detailed you are in these methods, the more accurate your answer is gonna be. So that's the benefit of that. So the six second is nice to get a rough estimate, but these other methods can get you more detail. So this is where you take 300 divided by the number of large boxes from one car cardiac cycle to the next. So you find an R wave that coincides with the bold line. And then if the next R wave on the bold line is one large box away, the answer is 300 beats per minute. So let's look at our example. So if I try to find one on a line, no, that one's really not on a line. Here, I could use this one. Okay. So. This one is on a line. How many large boxes pass before I get another? So again, large box. Oops, go back here. Large squares looks like this, right? So if I look at this, how many large boxes are between this one and this one? 
two, maybe not quite a half, so two. So what would the heart rate be for this person? 300 divided by two is 150. And does that make sense if I do the, the six second rule? One, two, three, four, five, six. So I can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I lost my counting now. I'll start at the end here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know what? I don't think this is the same paper. Is that? That's not marked. Every five. All right, so we could use a couple of these. We could use this one. So we have one, two large boxes and a half about. So that would be a heart rate of maybe 120. Or if we use this one, same thing. One, two large boxes and a little bit more. So 300 divided by 2.3-ish or 2.5, whatever, you're going to get a heart rate between 120 and 150. So that's the... Uh, large box method and then the small box method is good for very fast heart rates so now um, that's when the you know when it, they're coming so close together there is no large box in between them so then you just count individual squares you would take 1500 divided by the number of small boxes from R wave to R wave so we could use that with this one um, so we know there's let's see let's start with this one here is pretty accurate. So you've got how many small squares? Five, right? Correct? Five, 10, and then maybe two more. So that'll be 12. 1,500 divided by 12. Is 125. So that's pretty close. That's more accurate. We said about 120 using the large square. So 125, that gives us more accuracy. So the six second is pretty basic if you have a normal rhythm, and then the 300, and then the 1500 method. Okay, so it's just counting boxes. So be prepared to be able to do any of those three calculations to calculate heart rate. All right, going back up to our objectives then. We talked about that, we talked about the different methods. Um, recognize the major features, we talked about that. All right, now we're going to go through and look at all these different rhythm types. So the first one is normal sinus rhythm. We call it NSR. And I had to laugh at myself. When I was in nursing school, we had to, here at Western, um, in complex health alterations too, you have to go through all these rhythms again and identify them, and they're a big part of your exam, actually. So, I mean, you know, I teach this in advanced AMP. I work on a cardiac unit. I got into the exam, and, I, and I, this is the rhythm I got. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what is it? I don't, I don't see this, I don't see this, I don't see this, I don't see this, and I'm freaking out. I'm like, I don't know which one this is, because it doesn't have any of the parts that are abnormal, right? And talk about getting lost in the trees and not seeing the forest. That was a perfect example. Then finally, duh, it hit me. Well, that's because it's normal sinus rhythm. But I was freaking out for, you know, five minutes over this, looking for the abnormality. So don't let that happen to you because one of the options is a normal heart rate. <laughs> so how can you tell it's normal? So first of all, we have a very narrow QRS complex. We can see a visible P wave right in front of these. This is called the R, right? The, the highest peak is the R. So right before the R, the, ne the next bump is a small P wave, right? We see that. And then we see the larger T wave. And then there's a, a time period before the next one. So if this was stretched out, if after the T wave to the beginning of the P was stretched out, that would just indicate a slower heart rate, wouldn't it? As long as everything else is normal, that's not a big deal. But if we see a stretching out of the QRS complex, that's a big deal. Something's wrong. Okay, so that's what we look at. So this is normal sin sinus rhythm. Sinus tachycardia, this person might be exercising. This person might be stressed out, right? Maybe, maybe short of breath and their heart is beating a little faster. But it still looks normal, right? We have a narrow QRS. I can see my T wave, not much time before the next 
rhythm, there's my P wave again, and then my QRS, but every QRS has a P wave in front of it and a T wave after, would you agree? And about same distance between my R's, would you say, because this is, you know, how we calculate heart rate, would you say this person has a regular heart rate, not an arrhythmia? Yeah. Here's a really slow heart rate, really stretched out. So we call this sinus bradycardia. So anything less than what is bradycardia? Do you remember? 60, yeah, anything less than 60, we call that bradycardia. And this is important to diagnose because a lot of patients in the hospital are on medicines to help their heart function, and that slows the heart rate down. So if you're gonna give someone their blood pressure medication, say, because their heart rate, or because their blood pressure is high, you always wanna make sure you get a heart rate before you give them that pill because a lot of those medicines not only open up the vessels, but they slow the heart rate. And if they're already low, do you wanna be dipping it down even lower? No, so really, really important anytime you give a medicine that you take vitals on your patient and get a heart rate and blood pressure if you're giving a cardiac med because you know, people have slowed their heart rates to dangerous levels by giving medicine that wasn't appropriate for their problem. So that's sinus bradycardia. And then we have a lot of us unknowingly have these other rhythms that just pop in every now and then. Have you ever had too much caffeine and your heart kind of goes boom, boom, boom? And you wonder, oh, what was that? Or maybe if you've ever been stressed, uh, this happens, this is triggered by stress. The heart gets irritable during times of stress and we get extra ventricular contractions. That's why they're called premature. Because if I look at this, this rhythm, do you see the, the P wave, a normal QRS, then a T, and then a P wave? Everything looks normal. Then all of a sudden we have this wide, tall, upside down, or it could be the other direction, complex that doesn't match with the underlying rhythm. These are called PVCs, and they can be absolutely benign, but they're triggered by lack of sleep, um, not enough water, not, I mean, not severe dehydration, but for surely, you know, if someone was severely dehydrated, they could have this, but even just low water levels, caffeine, and stress. So some people have these and they go to the doctor thinking they're having a heart attack or that they're gonna have sudden heart stoppage because they have these abnormal rhythms and they're completely benign and they just have to deal with them. But sometimes improving sleep, hydration levels, limiting caffeine, limiting stress can help with this. People notice them oftentimes when they're relaxed. When you're running around and doing your thing at higher heart rates, PVCs don't really show up. They happen when the body is calming down, especially when people go to bed at night. They sometimes heal, feel like their heart's flopping around in their chest when they're getting ready to go to sleep, and that's just PVCs showing up at, high, at lower heart rates. And again, um, if, they, if you become symptomatic with them, like short of breath or dizzy, you know, or, you know, unusual feeling that you're not used to, then you should get them evaluated. But in most cases, they're benign. Just look for those wide, kind of isolated complexes. But other than that, there's a normal rhythm going on there. So this is called multifocal, because if you look here, this one looks a lot more different than this one does, wouldn't you agree? So this is a different type of PVC. I mean, it's still a PVC, but maybe the location is different than this one. But if you look at these two, those are originating from the same spot, so we call that unifocal PVCs. They look the same. They're the same height, same direction, same width. So it's one type of PVC occurring in this person's heart. Ventricular tachycardia, you don't see any P waves or T waves in there, right? So this is just rapid ventricular contraction. It kind of looks like mountain peaks is what I always think. And this is the scary rhythm. When we see VTAC, we know that that is gonna lead into the next deadly rhythm, which is V-fib, ventricular fibrillation. So VTAC is, is, a, is a scary rhythm that we wanna control. People are not feeling well when they're in sustained VTAC. Because the heart, I mean, what is the heart rate there? I mean, there's no pause between that ventricular, so there's no time for the ventricles to fill. They're not pumping, up, pumping enough blood to the tissues and to the brain. So people are feeling lightheaded. You know, they're gonna pass out in short order with this type of rhythm. So we get concerned when we see VTAC. Because what happens is if the heart is beating really rapidly, like 160 to 180, and then it stops beating regularly and it enters into a quivering mode. When it's quivering, there's no regular pattern to that 
complex, that QRS, even though it's wide, they were pretty much the same height, right? Here, they're all over the place because the ventricles are just quivering. So when they're quivering, when they're fibrillating, they're not fully contracting. And there is no blood flow going to the, to the um, vessels with any amount of pressure if it's quivering, right? So if I go to feel a pulse on someone who's in V-fib, am I going to feel a pulse? No, because there's no pressure if the heart is not fully contracting. So this is, you know, typically not going to have a pulse. And as a result of that, what do we do for people that are in V-fib? Shock them with an AED. Yeah, and that's why it's so important that when someone goes down, especially a young person at an athletic event, automatically you have to think they're in ventricular fibrillation. And the first thing we do is, you know, make sure they're not passed out just from low blood sugar or whatever, but if, you know, you try to get their attention, feel for that pulse, the carotid pulse, and if there's no pulse, you need to yell to someone right away, get an ID, get an AED, call 911, and then someone should start chest compressions while you're waiting for that AED, because time is essential when it comes to this rhythm, because the heart is not pumping effectively. Asystole, here it's not pumping at all, so uh, that's just a pretty much a flat line, so that's no contraction, because systole means contraction. So asystole means no contraction, person is, is dead. Atrial fibrillation, this is a really, really common condition. A lot of people have this that are walking around, grandmas and grandpas and young people. But typically, the older we get, the more likely we are to be develop atrial fibrillation. And here we can see there's a lot of P waves kind of unstable, unequal P waves. Looks like someone scribbled between the QRS complexes. That's how I can identify atrial fibrillation. So what that just means is that the atria are not fully contracting. They have these weak little contractions. So what happens to blood in the atria when there's weak contractions? Is it moving out and into the ventricles as forcefully? No. And what happens to blood when it doesn't flow? It clots. So people with atrial fibrillation are at risk for blood clots. So once they're identified as having atrial fibrillation and we can't fix it by doing a cardioversion where we try to synchronize the heart with its, our, we give it a zap, when, um, a synchronous zap with the rhythm of the heart. Um, when we can't fix it, um, then we give them um, anticoagulant medicines to make sure, because you see that like Cialis, right? Um, what are all those? Yeah, um, a real common one is warfarin or coumadin, real common. Um, so that's just to prevent the blood from clotting. Because if they have atrial fib and they say, oh, I don't want to take care of it, I don't want to take medicines, or they don't take their medicines, they're at risk for a heart attack because they're going to get a clot that can end up in a coronary artery or a stroke or uh, a pulmonary embolism or a deep vein thrombosis, wherever that clot gets stuck. So it's really, really important that people um, take an anticoagulant when they're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. But it's not really a deadly thing because we're going to study this week in lecture when we look at the cardiac cycle that most of the, the ventricles filled are filled passively. So 80% of the ventricles are filled just from venous return coming from the superior and inferior vena cava and pulmonary veins. The atria only fill up the last 20% of the ventricles. So people can do okay with atrial fib. They just need to make sure they're on an anticoagulant so they don't clot. Atrial flutter, same thing, a little more serious. Um, it has like a saw tooth. People say it looks like, you know what a saw blade looks like if you're, you know, cutting boards? It has that saw tooth appearance. That's unique to atrial flutter. So not quite as messy looking as atrial fibrillation. It's a little prettier of a rhythm, I think, but not something you want to be in, atrial flutter. And then if we look at the heart blocks, a couple of things we notice with heart block, and you should highlight this in your reading, I believe it's described in your reading, for heart block. Yeah, um, highlight prolonged PR interval. That's characteristic of a heart block. So if we look back here, 
what the PR interval is. Whoops. So the PR interval is from the beginning of the P to the start of the QRS. So if we go back to our example. So the beginning of the P to the start of the QRS, there's a slight delay there. And there's first, second, and third degree heart blocks. First degree heart block, not a big deal. Even second degree heart block is not a big deal. But third degree heart block is much more serious. So if I look at, for example, the first degree heart block, can you see how stretched out this PR interval, interval is here? There shouldn't be that big space from the P to the QRS, right? So that's an indication of heart block. Here we see um, a completely dropped QRS. Here there is no QRS after it. So that's a sign of second degree heart block. So here we see the, here you see the P wave, the QRS, the T wave. Here's another P wave, no QRS, another P wave, no QRS, and then a P wave in a normal rhythm here. So whenever you see dropped QRS complexes, think heart block. Same thing here, we see that long stretched out PR interval. Look at how wide this complex is in third degree heart block. This is the worst type. We have a very wide complex here. So what do you notice about the, the rate in all of these heart blocks? Slow. You're typically going to see, and that's, a, that's kind of a pattern you'll see too, you'll typically see bradycardia with heart blocks. but not sinus bradycardia, obviously, because they're in heart block. This is not normal sinus rhythm. And then we have pacemakers. Some people, their rhythm is goofy that they need a pacemaker installed, so they have an artificial device that's stimulating the ventricles. So you see this straight up and down line. This is called a pacer spike, we call that, which indicates that the pacemaker is driving that ventricle to contract. The atria are not doing it. So there's some blockage from the signal at the a SA node to the ventricles. So the pacemaker is creating that ventricular contraction. So look for the straight up and down spike of the pacemaker spike. So very important that we know where the AED is located. If you have kids that go to school or you're on a floor, nursing home, you know where you're, you know, you work in a nursing home or even if you work anywhere else that you know where that AED is located because you might need to get it in a hurry. How much time do we have from the minute someone goes down to where we need to restore circulation for them to survive? Um, it's like you don't have time to think about it. You just have to jump into action. And I've been in cold situations that I thought that I would be afraid and scared and kind of paralyzed with, oh my gosh, what do I do? But it's amazing that you know just getting that certification, even if it's been a while, when you're in that scenario, you really can't make a mistake. The only mistake you can make is sitting there and not doing anything. Get involved. Other people will join you, most likely. and you know, start working and doing what you can because it's better to have tried and been unsuccessful than to have not done something fast enough. So even if you don't know CPR, middle of the chest, right between the nipples, you expose the chest and start pushing, you know, about two inches down, two inches up, you know, put that chest and about the, you know, a rhythm of like that fast because you never know when you're going to need it. We, I had a student, I don't know if I told you the story, she was in my prep for A&P class and she was in nursing and someone went down. I told you about that, right? The, she drowned in the river, or their child drowned in the river and survived. So it can, you can definitely save a life. Okay, so let's go back to our objectives here then. Now you have a, a number of rhythms that are um, on that handout. So if you go to blackboard it's this last item here lab ECG's PDF so I want you to work together with someone right now and see if you can identify these rhythms and we'll go through the answers together on your sheet
there's 12 blanks. So you have to say, is the pattern regular or irregular? So you can put R or I. Or if there is no pattern, like asystole, that would be NA. And then the rate, figure out the rate. Whatever method you want to use is fine. And then name the type of rhythm that you see. And then we'll go over the answers together. So I'll give you about 15 minutes to work on that. Because you want to build your confidence with these. All right, so we're going to go over the rhythms on the sheet. And those are in Blackboard. Did I open those up yet? Maybe not. Go back to Blackboard. Here. All right, so rhythm number one. Do we have a first thing you want to ask is it regular or irregular? Yep, evenly spaced R waves, so yes, we would say that's regular. What did you come up with for a heart rate? 140 is correct. Yep, what method did you use for that? Yeah, you can just block off five of these. Each five is one second, so if you block off six of them, count the number of R waves in those six seconds, you would get what? 14 multiplied by 10, 140. Number two, regular or irregular? Regular. And what did you get for a rate? 40 to 45, depending how you, what method you used. So the first one, the, the actual rhythm, what would we call number one? Sinus tachycardia, because it's a higher rate, greater than 100. And number two would be then sinus bradycardia. How about number three, regular or irregular? Irregular for sure. And what'd you get for a rate? 90, 90, 90 to 95 is acceptable. And what type of rhythm do we have here? Yep, atrial fibrillation. It looks a little more scribble-like compared to the next one, right? All right, number four then. Regular or re irregular? Regular. And then the rate? 80 beats a minute, yep. And what type of rhythm do we have here? Yep, atrial flutter. It's got that kind of sawtooth appearance to those P waves. Number five, NA, right, is not <laughs> NA for the rate. So this is what? A systole. Number six, regular or irregular? Irregular. Can you calculate the rate? No. So that would be NA. And what is the rhythm? Yep, ventricular fibrillation. Kind of looks like scribbling. Number seven, regular or irregular? Regular. What did you get for a rate? 180. You, depending on the method, maybe you got 175. But yeah, 175 to 180. And what is the rhythm here? Yep, VTAC or ventricular tachycardia. Yes, yeah, because depending on the lead, you can sometimes have waves that go up or down. Regardless, you're just looking at the deflection from the baseline. Number eight, regular or irregular? Irregular. What's the rate? For this one, you would count just the, the normal QRS complex. Yep, 50 to 60. So this is actually, um, you know, there, it's a sinus rhythm in the sense that we have the, all the complexes necessary, but we have this unusual PVCs going on. So this would be sinus arrhythmia because it's irregular. So you've got PVCs. And if I look at the PVCs, are they unifocal or multifocal? Multifocal, yeah, because this one looks a lot different than these two, doesn't it? Yeah. Sinus arrhythmia, yep, with multifocal PVCs. 
Same thing. PVC, sorry, that means premature ventricular okay. contraction. Yeah, yep. So could you just add like PVC or does it have to be a longer Yeah, yeah, you have to look at what is the underlying rhythm because okay. these are like little anomalies that kind of just pop into a rhythm. So it's not, it's not a rhythm. It's just a little thing that occurs over the top of a rhythm. Now we can have something called SVT, which is just really high heart rate, you know, but that's not a PVC. PVCs are preventricular contractions. Number nine, regular or irregular? Regular. What is the rate? What'd you get? 80. 80, yep. And what type of rhythm do we have here? Pacemaker. Yeah, pacemaker. You see that dark vertical line right in front of every one of those QRS? That's a pacer spike. So kind of tricky to see, but they are there. Number 10, regular. Okay, what's the rate? 50, and what's going on with this one? Yeah, and if I look at that, I can see the, the prolonged PR interval, right? And what type of heart block do I have? Third degree, how did you know? the wide QRS complex. And also if we look at the um, PR interval, it gets longer and longer. Um, let's see, let me, I wanna take a look real quick. So third degree, you see a regular ventricular rhythm, but it has nothing to do with the P waves. The P waves and the QRS are com doing two completely different things. You would have pictures like this that you would analyze the rhythm. So, are we going to have to know like, the difference between the first No, no, just no heart block. Because if I look at your lab objectives, I don't see anything that distinguishes different types of heart block on your first page of objectives, and that's what we go off of. It just says heart block. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we were at number 11 then. Is this regular or irregular? Irregular because of the abnormal spacing between those R waves. And what is the heart rate? 60. And this is second degree heart block. And the way you can tell second degree heart block is sometimes you'll be missing a QRS. So the QRS is um, unevenly spaced, but here we see a P wave and there's no QRS. So you'll see dropped QRSs in the second degree. And number 12, irregular or regular? Regular, regular. what's the heart rate? 60. Now here, this is a heart block because we see the increased PR interval here, but we still see a QRS with every P wave. So that's first degree. Any questions? So be prepared next time to identify the vessels over the heart and identify the rhythms, use the different methods for rate calculation, and that should be it.